Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Chris Butler, who is a pastor and serial organizer. He lives with his wife and six children in South Chicago, and he also leads uh, the Chicago Embassy Church Network, which is a mission-based network of churches in the city of Chicago. He's also co-author, along with Justin Gibney and Michael Weir, of the book Compassion and Conviction, The And Campaign's Guide to Faithful Civic Engagement. And uh, last but not least, he is the co-host of one of my favorite podcasts, the Church Politics Podcast, with his friend uh, Justin Gibney. It's a fantastic podcast. They, they uh, I just love how both uh, Chris and Justin keep such a gospel-centered focus as they discuss um, uh, all kinds of things in the political world, and they do so with um, with a lot of wisdom and wit and kindness, and it's just a super helpful podcast. So I'm excited to talk to Chris. This was a fascinating conversation. And uh, without further ado, please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only Pastor Chris Butler. All right, hey friends, I'm here with uh, Pastor uh, uh, Chris Butler. Um, I almost called you Congress Congressman, but I, I know you've-, yeah, you've... <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> almost near, near congressman. Are, are you thinking about running again? Is that something that was in your past or is that a possibility for your future? Or are you allowed to say, um, you know, I suppose you're never allowed to say never, but it's, it's not something that is, uh, on the front burner at all. Okay. Okay. So focusing on your ministry and also what, what's your involvement with the and campaign? I, I know you and you and, uh, Justin do the podcast together, which by the way, is, is one of my favorite podcasts. It's you guys are just, yeah, it's, I love it. It's, it's so helpful. Um, is that the extent of your involvement? Or are you kind of with them on a part-time basis or? Uh, so I'm on the, uh, the executive committee, I believe is what we call it uh, at the end campaign. So just helping to think about the strategy and, and execute okay. some of the strategy at the end campaign. Um, and, and obviously I get the, the joy of doing the podcast with Justin, which is, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a joy. And it's great to hear you say that it's helpful because that's certainly why we started it. And, um, that's the main thing that we hope comes out of it is that it's helpful to yeah. somebody somewhere. Well, I, I, let me just, yeah, be more specific. I think you guys see eye to eye on a lot of things, but I, I love it that sometimes you'll offer different angles as well. And both of you are so kingdom focused that, and that comes through and whatever political thing you guys are discussing, it's just, you always bring it back to the gospel, both in the content in which you are advocating for and whatever issue, but also your posture, it shines really brightly. And you're just so thoughtful. I'm both of you guys are so well-versed in it and stuff. So all those ingredients are really hard to find these days in, in political discourse. So, which is why you guys are like my go-to source. So, yeah. Man, well, that's, that's just a, an, an, an honor an incredible honor to hear you say it. And I'm honored to be here with you. This is uh, an, another piece of uh, content that I think is helpful that goes out into the world. So thank yeah. you also for what you do. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'm excited for your, uh, for your involvement with Exiles in Babylon this year. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, <laughs> it's going to be a, I, th I almost said heated, not in a bad way. It's going to be an energetic uh, and challenging conference. So I'm, I'm super excited yeah. about it. But um, uh, so let's, let's uh, find out a little bit more about who you are. How, how did you, I mean, you have these kind of dual lanes you run in. You're a, a pastor, you've been in ministry for several years. Um, you're also involved uh, politically. Um, how did you get involved in both ministry and, and politics? Uh, so I got involved in, in, in the church, I would say, and politics uh, kind of at the same time. Like I, I, I say that I, I grew up on the front row of the church and on the front lines of kind of social justice work in Chicago um, because my parents were very church involved. Uh, you know, my mom teaching Sunday school and directing the children's choir. My dad drove the church van. Um, and, you know, we were always in church. Uh, and by the time I was in sixth grade, I actually slipped into uh, civics and politics because of a an issue with my uh, grammar school principal. Uh, they were going to fire her through a local school council process, which we have in Chicago, local school councils that are essentially many school boards at every school. Uh, and they had at that time the power to hire and fire principals. I was in sixth grade. I liked the principal. 
I didn't know much about, you know, the conversations they were having about budgets and all that stuff, but I knew I liked the principal. And so we started interrupting local school council meetings uh, to make sure they couldn't do the work of firing the principal. Uh, and turns out a local community organization got involved with that same fight, probably on uh, slightly more well thought out grounds. Uh, but they got involved with saving that same uh, principal. And I got uh, involved with the, the local community organization. And from there, uh, I was just in civics and politics and community issues uh, yeah. from the time I was 12 years old. Wow, that's crazy. Um, and then, so when did you become, did you, uh, when did you become a pastor then? Like, would you, were you, like at an early age, were you involved in kind of full-time ministry? No. So I also slipped into pastor. Uh, so <laughs> I was, I was working in, in, uh, in politics, um, and, and civics. My brother and I, uh, in 2013 started a, uh, public affairs consulting firm, which was a, a great next step. Uh, having done a lot of, uh, I had done electoral campaigns. I had, you know, worked in Springfield, the state capital in Illinois, um, been in some issue organizations. And so opening this firm was a great next step for us. And that's what I was doing. Um, but I was still very much involved with the church. Uh, very engaged lay leader, I would say, even I uh, did some uh, academic study for, I would say for Bible teaching, because I wasn't thinking about uh, vocational ministry. But I, I did, you know, at my church, I would preach from time to time, you know, once or twice a year. Um, taught Sunday school and that type of thing. And so, you know, wanted to invest in that. So I, I had done that type of thing. But in, in 2016, the pastor of, of my church uh, that I grew up in and the church that I pastor today actually became uh, ill with cancer and had to take time off. Uh, this was go This was a time where the church was already experiencing some difficulty. Uh, and so I had actually gone away uh, just to pray for the church. Mm. And I really felt like uh, some ideas were dropped in my spirit about what we might be able to do at the church. And so I did what any good consultant would do. I made a PowerPoint presentation uh, and I went to see my pastor. And when I walked him through the whole PowerPoint presentation, it was in that meeting that he told me, you know, I got this diagnosis. I've got to take time off. We're going to need an interim person. And uh, I was in here. He actually said he had been praying about who he should uh, recommend to the church as an interim. And he, was, he said, you know, you need to do this uh, because obviously God has given you a vision for the church. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started as the interim and uh, over about a year of, of treatment, uh, my pastor was fine. Uh, and when we came to the conversation after he was done with treatment uh, and had had beaten the cancer, his view was, I'm like, I think he was like 65 or 66. And he's like, I'm, I'm at this age. Honestly, I've been battling cancer and still my blood pressure has been lower uh, than when I was leading the church. So why don't we go and talk to the church about you stand on full time? And we did that. And that's how it ended up in the, wow. in the pastor. How many years has it been now? All right, so it is what seven years? It's 2023, okay. that was 2016, so seven years. Okay, how, how would you describe your if I can word it? Yeah, how would you describe your like political position or view viewpoints? Um, I, I know, I mean, because you're, you're a, a, a Christian pro life Democrat, well, that's a good starting place, right? Uh, although you yeah. told me off offline that you said if you're looking for a poster child. For the Democratic Party, you you are not it, and both you and yeah, Justin, I, I yeah. So I I, I think um, that especially these days, I, I think I've been this way most of my life, but especially these days, you got to think about your politics. It's much more healthy, I, I would say, to think about your politics uh, in terms of issues and communities and not mm. uh, parties and ideologies, because they have become so fixed. Uh, and you know, I grew up in Chicago. I uh, actually got bitten by that political bug uh, in 2012. Um, I mean, when I was 12, uh, I wish I was 12 in 2012. Um, <laughs> but when, when I was 12 years old, and by the time I was going into high school, 
Uh, it was the time of George W. Bush's first campaign for president, um, which you you recall uh, was this uh, compassionate conservatism. Mm -hmm. And that was very attractive to me. And I really wanted to become a Republican. Mm -hmm. But I was a little black boy on the west side of Chicago, and I couldn't find the Republican Party. Uh, so I <laughs> ended up um, working in a space that you know, we kind of call it independent democratic politics in Chicago. Uh, so it's a little bit less machine aligned, um, a little bit more uh, free willing. And uh, back then there were more pro-life Democrats uh, in Chicago and across the Midwest who sort of fell into that um, independent democratic uh, mm -hmm. space. But you, you have really machine mainline pol politicians at that time that could be uh, pro-life. Um, but the reason today I say I'm not a poster child for the left is because, you know, everything is so hard and fast. And if you diverge on any one point, then mm. uh, you can't find mm. uh, a place for yourself in a in a political party, uh, mm -hmm. which is really a different conception of political parties than what we really had um, in the United States. I mean, certainly parties are have, you know, viewpoints and sort of ideological leanings. And, and I certainly think that I'm more in favor of government being able to get involved in places where uh, it counts and where a lot of people can be helped. Uh, that would, in an old world, land me solidly in the Democratic Party. Mm. Uh, but some of the issues that, that I think are really deeply grounded in scripture that used to be more acceptable in the Democratic Party, unfortunately, they are not. And so while I like I ran for Congress as a Democrat, but if you talk to, you know, a lot of Democratic Party apparatchiks, they probably would not want a person of my sort of interesting <laughs> issue mix, uh, yeah. you know, representing the Democratic Party. Why do you think it's gotten so, I forget the word you use, but where it's like that to be a Democrat, you have to sign off on all these things and Republican, all these things where you said 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or long, you know, up until recently, it wasn't like that. Yeah. What has made it like that? Would you say, I mean, does Trump have something to do with it? Is it the social media polarization? I mean, I, algorithms and i don't know yeah see i i think and, and now you're gonna get me in, in more trouble um <laughs> but a lot of people would like to argue that trump is a cause i think that that trump is 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 a is an outcome of mm. a badly um polarized a very hyper polarized political environment and so in this environment, the main thought is who can beat the other side, who can, mm -hmm. you know, give them hell. And mm -hmm. it's not even a sort of proactive policy worldview kind of a thing that's driving a lot of our politics. If, if, if I really knew how we got here, Preston, I probably would be, you know, making a lot more money doing a whole <laughs> different set of things. You'd be a Pulitzer um, Prize winning sociologist. <laughs> exactly. And it, 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 but, but I do think that, you know, the kind of social media world where we now know that these algorithms have learned that they can keep our eyeballs longer by feeding us things that make us hateful and angry than by any other thing. Like even like certainly not thoughtfulness and reflection uh, and and even joy and mm -hmm. peace don't keep us there in front of the screen. Yeah. Um, and so we get a lot of the things that make us hate yeah. people and things. And so we uh, and, and so when the when that happens and we start to break down that general feeling of safety, then it's our. I think it's kind of our nature to retreat to corners. And when it's not about an engagement, like I, I always talk about like civic engagement and political engagement. Um, 
But when it's really not about an engagement, when it's about retreating to corners, that's when those uh, litmus tests and you got to check all the boxes really begin to take hold mm-hmm. um, in, in, in party machinery. Mm-hmm. Can we, I want to play around with that idea you suggested for a second. Cause I, I felt the same way, but you're way more well-versed in this arena than I am. And so by, and by the way, if I say anything that's just really stupid or off base, you have free reign to please, please correct me or suggest something otherwise. So I like to think freely in these conversations and, and sometimes that gets me into trouble. So um, yes. with this whole idea of Trump being a result, not a catalyst. I've thought that for a while. I don't know why I've thought that, but he he seems to be, yeah, a response more than a cause. I, I couldn't prove that, justify it, but it's, it's interesting to hear you say that. Uh, what what's Why would you, why do you think that is? Like, how would you, I guess, prove that point or maybe offer evidence for that? I think if you back up a presidency or two, Hmm. Um, you start to see some of this take place, right? Where, um, now I, I was a person who was like, you know, really against the Iraq war. Mm-hmm. And I think there were many justified reasons to be in that camp. But even in that movement, you started to see what I felt like was a little bit too much of a, a personification of the error of that um, foreign policy in George W. Bush. So this guy is the devil. And, you know, and, and, and also in that period, right, the, the Internet and the social media world is, is growing in the background. Right. Um, the Obama presidency. And, you know, I, I was an Obama guy. I worked on the Obama Senate campaign um, here in Illinois and uh, knew a, a number of folks who were involved in the presidential. Um, but it, that presidential campaign really didn't focus all that much on policy. Uh, it was a, it was hope and change and possibility and the future, but, but in a little bit of a way where all of that was personified, uh, in a way where is this person who can, you Mm -hmm. know, heal the planet and solve the problems of the world and it, it wasn't as much a party or an idea I, I think prior to that so much of so much of the time like the the politics especially at the presidential level the person was an embodiment of an mm. ideal a party and i and a, a set of ideas and approach to government and not a personification right uh but i think you know and you probably back up you know, another presidency, you know, even to the Clinton presidency Mm -hmm. and and start to see this kind of personality presidency Mm -hmm. um, taking hold. Uh, And so that's one of the dynamics. And then inside of the, the, the rough and tumble of the Obama presidency there, you did get a lot of very tough partisan battles where that was that was the first place where those battles start to play out. Um, then, you know, the, the Clinton campaign uh, comes in, the, the campaign that, that Donald Trump wins. Um, I think that, one, Donald Trump is, is able to win the primary just because I think presidential politics, you see this, you know, the next president is the response to the last person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in some ways... Trump was just a kind of anti-Obama. Uh, mm. Everything that he was, Trump was not. Um, and, but in the midst of that, you get this very difficult campaign. Um, it's a very difficult presidency. You know, healthcare, all these things, close votes. Um, you know, introduce the, also the world with this kind of like micro-targeted political campaign. So we're sending these very targeted messages to different communities because we know exactly what people are thinking and where they're going. And I mean, uh, hi- hyper targeting at a way that technology was allowing that we just weren't able to do before. Um, and so you start to sort of atomize the whole political scene. 
Uh, and th- those are the messages that are coming out of the political campaigns. Uh, you know, the social media is growing. Those algorithms are learning that, mm-hmm. you know, you got to make people mad. And politics is given a lot more fodder for making people mad than, you know, by the time we get to the 2016 campaign, and now we have fresh in our minds the 2020 campaign and, and the whole idea of, you know, election denialism and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 2016 was actually very difficult for a lot of people uh, mm-hmm. on the Democratic side. Uh, and there were there was plenty of feeling that this this election, you know, what about the popular vote? Were all the, the votes counted? You know, is this is this president legitimate? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, there are a lot of things that happen in our politics that are not. You know, who won the presidential election? And mm-hmm. I think that when we just look at our politics in terms of the presidential election, we miss so much. Because mm-hmm. most of that, I think, uh, is usually an outcome of, of things that are happening in the society more so than, um, you know, than they, they're producing what's happening in the society. Well, I mean, it's often been said, and I think this is what you're saying, that politics is downstream from culture. Is, is, that, yeah. is that debated? I mean, I mean... I've heard, I mean, it just seems so clear to me. And most people say that. Do people say no cultures downstream from politics? I mean, to me, it just seems clear. It's the other way around, but I don't think most people debate it. I think a lot of people who work in politics forget yeah. it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and begin to feel like they're producing culture or that they, at least that they have the opportunity to produce culture and politics teaches us the lesson that we don't. I mean, we, I just talked to all this stuff about the political realities and what's happening inside of politics. Uh, but, you know, you also, when you, when you look at President Trump, you have to look at a lot of things that are happening, you know, all throughout society and people feeling, uh, you know, you have cities and communities uh, over the country kind of hollowed out by 50 years of, um, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, globalization and, and, and these types of things. And you think that you can bring culture through politics, uh, but often you learn the lesson that you can't. And I, I can tell you, like, um, I learned that lesson in 2022 when I ran for Congress. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the numbers and you say you're going to run for the Democratic uh, Party nomination for the first district of Illinois and you're pro-life, you know, that's a, uh, that was a steep hill to climb. Um, mm-hmm. now I think the, you know, at the beginning of our campaign, we had calculated that the, um, the, the, uh, the decision on abortion was not going to come out until after the primary, but then it leaked in the winter. Um, but so we, we had more of a chance than, than we ended up having, uh, at the beginning, but still, when I look back at it clear eyed, that's one of those things was like, we're going to teach people to be pro life through this campaign. And mm. many, many times politics teaches us, you know, mm. no, that's not the case. And I think mm. a lot of people came to 2020 um, or 2016 thinking Donald Trump could never be elected president of the United right. States. And, but reality will teach politics often uh, a, a lesson. I th- yeah, I, yeah, that's interesting and way more sophisticated than I could have articulated. I, I, I you know, as I look, as I look on, kind of almost from a distance, um, yeah, Trump it, being a byproduct of kind of other cu- cultural undercurrents to me just it just makes a lot more sense. And it, for for new listeners who haven't heard me talk about this, just to be clear, I mean, I think Donald Trump is clear evidence of the moral depravity of humanity. I mean, he's so deranged. He believes his own lies. He is, I mean, he's the epitome of the empire really, but that's a whole nother conversation. So if, if I, but in this day and age, if you don't do nothing, but just denounce somebody as, if you even try to explain how could he get elected? And, and if your conclusion isn't well, cause you have 80% of the evangelical church, they're all flaming racist. They wear white hoods and you have a bunch of people that, you know, it's like, well, it's a little more complicated yeah. than that too. I think, I mean, you put up Hillary 
as Bill Burr says, you know, you have a choice between this racist and the devil in 2016. <laughs> like, <when you laughs> these are options, you know? Like, <laughs> I mean, you have yeah. two faces of the empire. One's male, one's female. And both of them, I wouldn't trust to watch my kid for two seconds. But um, I, I, it does, I wonder, like, the social movement, it, 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 it does... It seems like there was this aversion against what some people perceived as an authoritarian left-wing culture with the sort of rise of political correctness. If you don't believe in same-sex marriage, you're a bigot and a hate monger. You don't say this word, say this word and do this, that. And I think people got kind of frustrated and they wanted the bull in the China shop to just go and, quote, drain the swamp or blow things up. Combined with a profound distrust for just politicians as a whole, they're all liars, they're all corrupt, you know, is the perception. And then you have, you know, Hillary saying, if you vote for him, you're, you know, you're deplorable or like 50% of his, you know. So I think, I think there was this just a, a, a frustration among people who didn't toe the kind of far left wing party line or cultural, no, the toe, toe the cultural. And then he was kind of a reaction against that. And they're like, yeah, but he's, he says racist things. He's, you know, he talks about women that are really derogatory. Well, for a culture that's, you know, 60% is watching porn every night. I don't think they care about some comment, you know, that was yeah. caught. You know, it's like if you put a hot mic up to any how, uh, locker room or pastoral office, I mean, what are you going to find? So I think people roll their eyes like whatever. He's going to go and he's going to, you know, say it like it is, you know. I'm not justifying. I, all I'm doing is trying to explain on a sociological level how somebody as deranged as he is could get elected. I don't think it's necessarily because every single person that voted for him is just a, a flaming racist and a bigot and a homophobe and all these things. I, I think it's it certainly has some of it, but I think it's, it's more complex than that. And I think until the, the left realizes that they're going to keep getting people like him elected <laughs> quite honestly. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that there are, these opportunities, these times when, like I said, what's actually happening out in the world um, teaches mm -hmm. people who work in elected politics all the time. I mean, most of the time, uh, people who work in elected politics think that they can bring a reality to the people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I actually admire about American voters is that they are a whole heck of a lot more self-aware hmm. and, and smart than a lot of people who work in electoral politics and in government give them credit for. Um, you know, and you can, you can pull some things over, but those, those general sort of like waves and, and that vibe in, in the culture and in society – People know what that is and people know what they're looking for. Uh, and just because you go out and tell them that they need something else is not going to make mm. them forget what they're experiencing yeah. in their everyday life. So a lack of involvement, extensive involvement with kind of real people on the ground is there's a disconnect between at least uh, we're talking more national politics, at least. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think so. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of that is bleeding into local politics more mm. and more. Um, and, and it's why you see fewer and fewer people, um, I think, participating in our institutions um, and in, in voting and the whole electoral process, not because they don't know, not because so much they don't care, uh, but they just don't see it as a primary vehicle for creating change in their present reality. Mm. Um, you know, the, I was talking to somebody uh, very recently in the last week about this, you know, election that's setting up between uh, what looks like now between two guys who nobody wants to be president. Um, <laughs> and but, it's, you know, it's a campaign that nobody wants. Everybody's going to get. And people are like, well, you know, would you ever consider voting for Trump? You know, because Trump is so bad and he was this and he's that. And I ask a question that I always ask, and I ask this question even before Donald Trump was on the scene. How different, really, was your life under huh. Joe Biden for the last four years than it was under Donald Trump for four years? 
Mm. Like, where, where does it actually, you know, mm. impact your life? So much of our government is consumed with the realities experienced by the very, very wealthy and the very, very powerful. Um, so much of that focus is shared between the two major political parties um, that, so you know, our, our uh, congressional districts are gerrymandered such that vast, vast majority of them are, you know, safely in one party's control or the other. So most of these parts of our federal government right now are just interchangeable personalities, you know, but ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, most of it doesn't change. Like it just stays the same. So wait, so this is getting into more of what I know you're passionate about, more local politics rather than national politics. So are you, would you, are you saying, I, cause I've, I've thought this, but I have no, nothing to just to back it up, but like that national, whoever's in office on a national level, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the life of the common person as much as maybe they would think or how is that, would that be what you're saying? I, I would advance that for sure. Um, okay. And this is this again is not a reaction to you know the last four years or the last eight years. This is something that I, I think I've held to be true for a long time. It's it's present for me because I do feel like national politics is creeping into so much of our local politics, uh, okay. such that we think about who we're going to vote for for mayor in the context of what they think and say about Donald Trump. And, you know, those things really make local politics weird. Um, Mm -hmm. Local politics, I think, should be the place where people uh, can really come together around um, concrete problems and and make concrete solutions, right? Um, You know, about infrastructure projects and community safety and uh, schools and all those types of things that people where people are actually living in that reality mm-hmm. every day, right? Regardless of who was president, people who send their kids to school, they send them to school every day, no matter who is the president. Um, and most of the time, what they study doesn't change um, based on who's the president. As a matter of fact, if somebody becomes president who changes things about education, if your kid's in third grade, it will never impact their third grade. It might impact their sophomore year of high school, right? Like that's just the, the nature of the, you know, the, the kind of uh, bureaucracy and everything. So those local politics should be safe from some of these more ideological fights, but more and more they're just not. This episode is sponsored by Biblingo. Uh, Biblingo is an incredibly effective and efficient way to actually learn the biblical languages of Greek and Hebrew. Okay, so as many of you guys know, I'm a huge advocate for learning the biblical languages and not just for pastors or like theology professors, but for any Christian who is interested in diving deeper into the meaning of the scriptures, it is incredibly helpful to know Greek and Hebrew. I also understand, however, that you know, few people have the time and money to go to seminary or get a Bible college degree and, you know, take all the classes you need to take in, in order to learn biblical Greek and biblical Hebrew. This is why I'm so excited to introduce to you Biblingo. Biblingo uses modern methods of learning languages that make learning intuitive and fun. Some people like me are intimidated at the very idea of learning a language, especially an ancient language like Greek or Hebrew. But with Biblingo's research backed approach, Learning Biblical Greek and Hebrew is not only achievable, but it's actually, I'm serious, it's actually fun. Uh, Biblingo has helped people from all walks of life uh, dive deeper into the Bible through its original languages. All you need is 15 minutes per day, 15 minutes per day. Um, Consistency is the key ingredient to learning any language. And with just 15 minutes per day, you can be reading the Bible in Greek or Hebrew in just over a year. Uh, Biblingo breaks down the learning process into interactive activities that can be completed in just a few minutes a day. Um, This makes it really fun and actually uh, doable. You can actually do this consistently every single day. 
So if you want to dive deeper into your knowledge of the scriptures, just go to biblingo.org forward slash T-I-T-R. Okay, that's biblingo, that's B-I-B-L-I-N-G-O dot org forward slash T-I-T-R. And you can sign up for a free 10-day trial run. Okay, so try it out for 10 days, see how you like it. And if you decide to sign up, you can uh, use the code TITR and you can get 30% off a subscription for a full year. Okay, so biblingo.org forward slash TITR. Check it out for you know 10 days for free. Then use the code TITR to get 30% off a full one year subscription. I really hope you guys check this out. When it comes to reading and understanding the Bible, my number one piece of advice is to read the whole Bible over and over and over. It's so important to gain a good view of the forest before you analyze the trees. But sometimes reading the whole Bible can be really daunting. I mean, not only is it like a really large book, but let's face it, some parts can be super hard to understand. This is why I'm so excited about the Bible Recap, a one-year guide to reading and understanding the entire Bible by Tara Lee uh, Cobble, a friend of mine who I had on the podcast not too long ago, episode 1067. So the Bible Recap takes you through the whole Bible, and and then it explains each day's study in short two-page summaries of each portion of scripture that you just read. And what I love most about the Bible Recap is that it's focused on what each section of scripture reveals to us about the person and work of God. So it doesn't fall into like human-centered moralism. It keeps the focus on what the Bible tells us about God. In fact, a couple of my kids are actually gonna be trying to read through the whole Bible this next year, and they're gonna also be going through the Bible recap alongside their yearly uh, Bible reading. Uh, Terry Lee Cobble, uh, the author of the Bible Recap, I mean, she's awesome. She's a relentless researcher when it comes to scripture and a, a super clear and engaging writer. Uh, and she's also the host of the super popular The Bible Recap podcast. Um, so yeah, I would invite you to go check out uh, Theology and Raw episode 1067, where I had an awesome conversation with Terry Lee Cobble and you could hear her heart for uh, God and scripture. Um, so I highly recommend buying The Bible Recap for yourself. Uh, or for someone you know that's wanting to wrap their mind and heart around the storyline of scripture, just go to thebiblerecap.com to find out more. That's thebiblerecap.com. Why do you think it is that people, like there are people, and this is going to be on each side, that if, say, Trump gets elected, they're going to think that basically society, it's over. Democracy is over. Um, it's, you know, Christian nationalists are going to, rain in the White House. We're going to have, you know, January 6th every single day. We're going to have, um, you know, a bunch of um, weirdos in the Supreme Court talking about Jewish space lasers or whatever. I don't know. I'm mixing, mixing people here, whatever. But like, uh, there's, there's that, you know, the, the, I, I would call it, you know, Trump derangement syndrome where there's just the, that, that is society is going to crumble if he gets elected. And then people on the other side would say the same thing, you know, Biden gets elected. We're going to have, you know, post-birth abortions being legalized. We're going to have, you know, 13 year old people being transitioned and whatever the, the age for consent for transitioning is going to be lowered. We're going to have just, you know, the economy is going to collapse. <laughs> I can keep going, but I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> you, you know, so, so why do you think, do you think they're just absorbing too much kind of propaganda based news that produce fear to garner your support? That would be my suggestion. I mean, when I, when I go to these news outlets on both sides or even Twitter accounts or whatever, I'm like, Oh wow. If this is what you're absorbing. Yeah. You could, I could see how people get radicalized and think the other side is just, you know, subhuman, whatever, but like, goodness, like let's turn these, turn it off for a second, you know, and talk to real people. But yeah, it's certainly, you know, that, that idea of, of media hygiene is one of the things that feeds um, that kind of thought process. We certainly, you know, we talked about the um, social media's role uh, in all of this in, in terms of feeding just the, you know, the worst of us, um, you know, <laughs> back to us. And, you know, and, and then I think it also, though, has to do with the flow of money in our politics. Um, because the, the more big money is, is allowed to flow into local politics, uh, the more those national themes that those larger concentrated donor groups, I hesitate to say care about, but at least think about, um, the more they, 
flow into our local politics. And I, I think that's just so bad mm. for us. Mm. Do you think it's, how would I word it, necessary or important um, or unnecessary for a Christian slash churches to be involved in local politics? And I, I guess I want to acknowledge the different geographical context. I mean, I, I live in Boise, Idaho. That's going to be a little different, I think, than South Chicago, where you're at, where um, mm-hmm. people are less affected here by... Well, let me just stop there because I might say something super ignorant. Um, I've been around enough to know the different social environments. Really, really it makes a, a bigger difference in some areas versus other areas. I think that's kind of my assumption. But mm-hmm. yeah, do you, do you think it's a, it's vital that Christians get involved, or do you think it's like some should, but it's not necessary? Is is this necessary for loving our neighbor? Is how it's often framed. To caring for the marginalized, uh, to making sure people don't drop below, the, you know, drop through the cracks. Is this nece- a necessary expression of our Christian faith to be involved in local politics? Um, I probably would stop short of saying that it is necessary. Um, I do think that it presents an awesome opportunity uh, to 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 pursue, you know. The, the great commandment to love our neighbors, um, you know, the great requirement to uh, do justice and uh, mm-hmm. love mercy. Um, even for those who, who practice in this space, uh, like I have, to pursue the great commission. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've probably done some of my most effective discipleship in the context of uh, the consulting firm that, that we ran. Um, hmm. for three years. So I think that it's an opportunity to do that. I, I would stop just short of saying that it is, that it's necessary. Okay. Um, but I do think it's often a very good opportunity um, to do those things. You, I, I always urge people to, to be aware of your context um, hmm. because different sort of, um, sort of church contexts. You know, I, I come from a, a, a black church uh, background where the church is very much the center of, um, you know, a lot of things, you know, culture, economics, politics, uh, it all kind of flows through the church. So it's very natural. Um, mm-hmm. And that may not be the reality. I, actually, I, I, mean, I know it's not the reality in every, uh, you know, sort of church context, the community context um, also has a lot to do with how much of an opportunity. Uh, mm-hmm. In Chicago, there's so much of what happens uh, in the city has to do with the decisions of people, especially people who are in local government. Uh, and so it's very hard for the churches here to say that they're going to stand up for justice and be completely uninvolved in the mm-hmm. um, and, and I guess, you know, I, I'm talking a, a whole lot, but I, I also draw a little bit of a line between civic engagement and political engagement mm. um, because they they interact, but I, I, I don't think that they are exactly the same. Uh, and sometimes you can be civically involved and not so political. Uh, uh. Unfortunately, you have a lot of people who are very political and not very civic. Um, and so, you know, as a Christian, I think we got to be thinking through all of those things. Like, how much politics am I going to be doing? How civically involved am I going to be? Uh, and your context is going to have a lot to do with, you know, how much of that opportunity you're going to seize upon. That's really helpful. I love that distinction between civic and, and political. Do you think it's, and this, so is it too naive or incomplete or utopian to suggest like, in whatever ways our political leaders we want to, in whatever ways we want to like empower political leaders to care for the marginalized and poor, what if the church stepped in and did that? Like if the church was functioning the way it was designed, do you think we would need um, to rely on political systems to love our neighbors? And I would say, let me qualify my own question even like, obviously if there's a blatant unjust law, I'm thinking like the civil rights movement or something like that, like, hundred percent, like let's work to change unjust laws. Um, and there's still plenty of those, you know, I, I don't know enough, but I mean, prison reform and, 
and fair housing and, and other things like that. Um, but beyond that, like I'm even thinking of the organization in, in Chicago, uh, together, together, Chicago. Are you, do you know about? Yeah. I mean, here's, you know, the whole issue of like, you know, gun violence in particular is, is a, is a huge problem. I mean, all around the country, but in South Chicago in particular, and here's a network of loads of Christian leaders that are saying, let's rather than vote the right person in office to have a certain gun, you know, gun policy or whatever, like that might be, yeah, that might not be bad, but come on, like, like this is just gonna be an ongoing kind of political debate. It's whatever, but we can get together and, and help, um, help address you know, the issue from the roots, you know, um, working with yeah. single parent households and, and discipling kids and getting people off uh, out of gangs and stuff. And I think they're doing, I mean, amazing, from one of the little I've seen, I'm like, this is incredible. Like they're, they're doing, they're being the church and doing what politicians say they're trying to do, but I think never will. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a long question, but I'm, I'm just thinking it's a, it's a genuine question too. I'm not trying to, you know, but like, could the, if the church was actually being the church, which is a political entity, I think, um, would we even have much of a need for political leaders to step in? So, I mean, and this, this is probably going to get back to that sort of, I mean, that essential question of how much government yeah. needs to be involved uh, is what sits at the sort of base of our party system Thank you. Hmm. Um, in the, in the, I guess, traditional sense, not today's partisanship. Um, I kind of follow this. It's, it's interesting that you bring up Together Chicago. So Together Chicago uh, actually grew in many ways out of uh, something called the Chicago Peace Campaign um, hmm. that, that I helped organize huh. at some point in the past. I don't want to get into lying with years. Um, one of the ongoing conversations uh, that happens with those of us who participate, because my church uh, participates in uh, a lot of the Together Chicago work. That pastor awesome. who I was telling you about at the beginning, who founded the church that I pastor, uh, is the uh, vice president for church engagement at Together Chicago. Oh, right on. Uh, that's what he's doing in ministry today. So we very much participate. But one of yeah. the conversations that happens among those of us who are participating in Together Chicago's work is if we can ever scale this without engaging government, mm. right? Um, so I, I, I don't think that it's a particular gun policy uh, in Chicago that's going to be uh, the solution. But there are solutions around police interactions, mm. uh, around engaging uh, you know, those folks who are at risk, who engages them, how they engage them, where they engage them. When I look at it, I do see Together Chicago as a as a meaningful program, a um, an expression of what the church should be, mm -hmm. uh, which is salt and light. Uh, so mm -hmm. that preservation um, in terms of the salt, but in in, in my view, my, my read of it is that part of that being of light is is sort of been a source of revelation. And okay. so it's like we're figuring out stuff here, like stuff that works. And government, if it were functioning well, could pick up some of those things and make them happen. And, and that's so that's what I'm, I'm talking very mm. much like a Democrat. I, I lose some of my fellow Chicago Democrats uh, when I point out the fact that for whatever reason, when folks go pray with these gang involved youth, you know, some they get on this path and together Chicago is seeing that a lot of these uh, young people are getting on a different path. So we need to put this in policy and why we cut out the prayer part, right? Mm. Like it's working. And we're trying to get kids on a different path. If prayer is working, then let's get the whole city praying. Not because we're trying to make a state religion, but because we got data that say when people go pray with these particular this particular population, uh, is part of getting them out of a bad situation to a good one. 
and we want to see them get into a good situation. Um, and, you know, so, so many times when, when you approach it like this, you face tension on, on both sides. Cause I, I face tension here in Chicago from folks who are like, no, we don't need to depend on the government. You know, mm. we're just going to do it. The church, I'm like, yeah, but the church is not going to scale this over, you know, 200 and, uh, you know, 2.8 million people in the mm. city of Chicago. Like government's going to have to step in here. But then I turn around to government and I'm like, but we need to do it how they're doing it, right? Like you, you mm. can't replace some of those essential parts and expect that it's going to be the same, right? Uh, so I, I think there, there are probably contexts and places where the church can carry the load and, and mm-hmm. man, if we can, and every place that we can, I think we absolutely should. I maintain that there are areas that, that, that would be really hard for the church to scale to. Um, and, and so, you know, government, I think is the, the institution that has that kind of scope and reach. But I think government is too often hesitant um, to pick up some of the activities of the that the church is engaged with that that clearly works. So I'm, I'm hearing you say it's it's not an either or. It'd be a false dichotomy to say just be the church and c- could care less about uh, government involvement and stuff. Um, now that's 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 really helpful. And I, again, I love the the emphasis on the local church or sorry, the well local church, obviously, but also lo- the local political issues for lack of better terms and civic engagement. Um, I, I do think, I don't know, <laughs> this may be too cynical, but I, I do think sometimes the, the loud national fights and stuff, it just, it, it does become kind of a distraction. I mean, it's just, it just, I border on sadness and anger when anytime there's a shooting, it just gets so politicized so fast, you know, it's like all people care yeah. about is, advocating for this law or that law or people waving the second amendment, this, and then I don't know. It's, it's like, gosh, all that just can be so distracting when in front of us, right in front of us in our neighborhoods, there's, there's local issues you can get involved in. Um, Chris, I didn't prep you on this, but I, 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 so one of my favorite podcasts you and Justin did, um, it was, is your, uh, kind of monologue in particular was on the, the, the problematic nature of the word woke. <laughs> I didn't prep you on. Are you, are you, is it fresh enough in your mind? Can you give us a few minutes on why you don't prefer this term? Because it's thrown around so much and I, I have not been excited about it, but I couldn't always put my finger on it until I listened to your podcast. And I was like, Oh my word, this is exactly how I was feeling. I understand when people use the term and I don't, you know, I don't, get so upset when people use the term. I just think, ah, is there a, is there a better adjacent phrase or word you can use to describe the very thing that's legitimate? I, I, I get what you're trying to yeah. say, but this word, uh, I just don't really prefer it. Can you um, help us out here, Chris? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if I can help, but I can, I can share. Um, <laughs> the, I have sort of two issues that converge on that word. Number one is that the word is, it's an actual phrase. A, a social is a movement word uh, that was sort of co-opted, right? So it originally uh, is a a word that sort of grows out of a black consciousness movement, right? Mm -hmm. And it is the idea of, you know, waking up to the fact of, you know, sort of the black experience in America, how that sort of shapes the the way that we exist in the world today and it, and and real wokeness is not just about what has happened to us but it's, it's what has happened to us what has happened through us what has mm. happened around us what has happened in us um and is so is this kind of black consciousness raised it, um that i think the the word originally began to express in terms of being a movement word um some of the folks, I think, who originally started to use the word would probably fall into what we would call a more socially conservative um, sort of framework, which we don't talk about it much, but this is the reality 
this has been the reality at least for a long time in the black community. The black community is more conservative on on social issues generally um, than a lot of people think. Uh, and so you're sort of co-opting, or you're not taking a word that didn't mean anything and started to use it in this way. You're, you're sort of co-opting a word that already had a specific movement used, uh, mm. and you're reappropriating that. And so I already have a little bit of an issue with that. Mm. Um, so, and and then once you start to reappropriate it to just be code for everything that I don't like, um, it it becomes problematic, right? Um, because now I don't have to actually debate an issue. I don't actually yeah. have to argue right, right or wrong on this point. Um, I can just dismiss the mm-hmm. idea as wokeness. And I think that that mm-hmm. harms both sides uh, of, of, of any argument, right? Because, you know, as, as much as somebody might dismiss, um, you know, certain issues of wokeness, one of the issues that that I care a lot about and have worked on uh, in in my life is uh, protecting the the life of the unborn. Um, mm. Not a very popular issue these days, uh, <laughs> and you know, but I don't want people if if somebody supports abortion, I don't want somebody to just dismiss that position as woke mm. because I want the person who is willing to, you know, terminate this life in the world to have to actually make that argument, right? And I, I think if you just dismiss it as wokeness, then it's easy, it's mm-hmm. categorical, it is, you know, sort of doctrinaire in a way that's unhelpful, even if, if what you want to do is, is deconstruct the argument. Yeah. When I'm dismissing it as wokeness, I don't have to make the argument against it, but I also don't have, I don't make you have to make an argument for mm-hmm. it because mm-hmm. now all you got to do is either accept the woke branding, which, mm-hmm. you know, some people are happy to do. Right. And so, and, and then you, that becomes a badge of honor for stuff that people couldn't actually argue for. It was like, right. it's woke. I'll just yeah. do it. Cause it's woke. <laughs> And the flip side. So I, I, I'm I'm not a fan of the term. I don't think it's helping <laughs> the discourse, which I think yeah. needs a lot of help. I, I it, it's I think it's intellectually lazy. I and, and not I think when people use it, I don't I don't think they realize that maybe. And it's exact. Is I would say okay. I, I I like to say okay. Is there an equivalent on the other side? I, I think sometimes. You, conspiracy theory is another one you know like two years ago the lab leak theory was a conspiracy theory you get you kicked off twitter and now it's like i mean most people are like yeah it probably was leaked from the lab you know like um i mean it's yeah, I mean, just to dismiss something as conspiracy theory it's like okay provide the evidence that this claim is untrue and deconstruct the evidence for this claim and supply superior evidence in favor you know do do the work um and i think woke on the, usually the right to the left is kind of the same thing. And another thing I don't like is it does, it, it seems a signal to a right wing crowd. And, and as Christians, I just want to further detach people from this hyper partisan allegiance or hyper right left wing allegiance. And the term woke, it just, it just does that. It just stirs up kind of strife. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I think it's all what you just described. Like it's, it's actually all the same problem, right? It is, it is this sort of easy side choosing um, mm-hmm. that yeah. does not encourage, especially for those of us who are believers. Uh, I'm yeah. giving a talk later on today, and it's you know, one of the things that, that I try to encourage Christians who are involved in politics is that Christianity encourages us to be contemplative and. Mm to practice reflection and uh, to meditate and to think deeply and anything that discourages that type of behavior is, 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 is dangerous to our Christian ethic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that holds true in politics. And, and while I don't like the word woke, I think that most of our discourse these days, political discourse is, is is those types of buzzwords, mm. you know, 
wokeness and um and again like words that used to mean something but yeah. you know anything you know, wokeness and maga and conspiracy yeah. and you know on it 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 doesn't actually mean anything it, it it's a word that exists to mean your worst conception of what you can possibly assign to that word. Do you, I heard a couple of people say they find the word to be racist. Do you, would you say it's, it's racist or, um, and I think it has to do with their first they point find, about, they find pe- the word woke. To yeah. Be like, like when white people use it critically that they would say that's a, that's you're, you're being racist because you're appropriating a term that originally meant something meaningful to the black community. Um, so, I mean, I can see where people are coming from with that. Uh, I, two things. One, I think that it would have to apply uh, to white folks using it on the left and the right, because right? mm-hmm. there, there are plenty of folks who take the term woke as a badge of honor and okay. appropriate it still in a way that is not in that in that sort of essential mode of black conscious racing. So I think if, if you're going to you know, call it racist, from that perspective, I would just say make sure you know that you include you know white folks on the left in, in that same okay. behavior. Uh, racist to me is also one of those words that yeah. you know, as somebody who has worked a lot on racial justice and um, you know and, and issues around race, uh, it, it's unfortunate that everything can so easily be racist. Uh, these days, I I would argue that, you know, somebody using the word woke in the way that I just argued it would have to be pretty well read to be Mm. proactively racist with using the word. Okay. Yeah. Um, Which are probably not. (laughs) Right. So, you know, I, 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 I think that, you know, like I said, I've worked on racial justice a lot. Um, and it's an important issue that needs to be worked on uh, continually. But it diminishes the value of that work when all of a sudden everything that I don't like is racist. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, if, if David Duke, if, if, you know, some of the lowest levels lowest uses of most wide uses of racist, you know, if I'm a white person and I simply participate in or benefit from being a white person in society, then I too am a racist. I'm like, okay, is David Duke a racist? Yes. He's a racist. Am I a racist? Yes. You're a racist. Well, I, we need a, can we have a different term for each other? I don't want to be like, like arm in arm with David Duke just because, you know, so, um, yeah. Or even, think, white, even white supremacy to, can be used that way in my mind. I think I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm still kind of thinking through that one, but. Well, I, um, I think that all those things that you're raising are, is a, are important. And I would say to somebody who is working on racial justice and who cares about racial justice, that is equally important to have those uh, delineations mm-hmm. because if, if you're working on racial justice, you also don't want David Duke and, you know, the white kid who got into Duke to be the same <laughs> problem. Like, how do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do you actually work yeah. that out if it, it's all the same problem? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that it's important to be able to delineate. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time. This has been, uh, yeah, this has been so helpful, man. I wish I, I, I um, yeah. Which every time I had a question, I could just call you up, but that'd be about probably several phone calls a day. Uh, so I will not bother you. You have made plenty of work to do, but this has been super helpful for me. Thanks for being on Theology Raw. I'm really looking forward to you speaking at the conference as well. I've enjoyed it. I look forward to being with you. All right. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.